St. John, chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. And I would like to talk to you from the topic. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Loving and Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour. We come, Father God, asking for your blessing and help as we are gathered together. Father God, we pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you would clearly, clearly, Heavenly Father, show us how to conduct our work with the spirit of joy and the spirit of enthusiasm. Give us the desire to find ways to excel, Heavenly Father, in our work. Help us, dear Master God, to work together and to encourage each other to excellency. We ask that we would challenge each other to reach higher, to reach farther, and be the best that we can be for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, your Son, with thanksgiving in our heart. And the church said, Amen. St. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 4, reading from the King James Version. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ornament and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. May God add a blessing to the reader, hearers, and doers of his holy and divine word. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. This is a hard lesson to learn. No one likes to wait. We want what we want from God when we want it. However, it is in our time of loneliness, in our time of loss, pain, sorrow, that we are driven to the very heart of God. This chapter centers upon a special home in the town of Bethany in Palestine. The name Bethany means house of, house of dates. This was a special place and a home for several reasons. It was special because Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, they lived there. These were two sisters and a brother who knew and loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Their hearts were open to Jesus, and, and so was their home. Since there was no Motel 6 to leave the light on in that day, travelers depended upon the hospitality of the local people to receive them into their home and to help them along the way. This home was always open to Jesus, and he would often stop by. He would rest, and he would eat there. This home was special, church, because it was filled with the love of God. Jesus was always welcome here. This was a place of rest and refuge for the Savior during his earthly pilgrimage. In verse 2, John mentions one example as evidence of love in that home. He says it was that Mary, which anointed the Lord with ornament, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Follow me now. In verse 1, we read that news came to Jesus and his disciples informing them that Lazarus was sick. The disciples were all too aware of the attachment Jesus had with his home, and especially Lazarus. But upon receiving the news, the disciples, they began to anticipate the Savior's response. As we look in verse 3, it says, Therefore his sister 
sent unto him, saying, Lord, he whom thou lovest, he's sick. Mary and Martha did not give instruction for Jesus to come to their aid. That would be unnecessary. Surely he would come and with hate after all. Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus would rush right over to Bethany and render aid to his friend Lazarus. Or so everyone thought. And somehow these sisters, church, in a distressed frame of mind, were able to send a message to Jesus. And the message is absolutely beautiful. It's just loaded with truth. Listen to it in verse 3. Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And you can almost catch, catch the flavor. The word behold could be translated. Listen. Listen, Lord. Listen. The one whom you Love is sick. It's a tender, humble, beautiful, simple message. There's no medical diagnosis in here. Lord, Lazarus has compound whatever of the whatever. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say, Lord, here's the problem. Now we, you got to do something, Lord. No, it doesn't even ask him to do a thing. Did you look at it again? It doesn't even ask the Lord to do anything. It just say, Lord, listen. The one you love is sick. That's all. It doesn't tell him what to do. It's a surrender of love. It just say, Lord, here's a need. And that's all it says. It doesn't even say his name is Lazarus. But the Lord knew who he loved. That was no problem there. That has a lovely humility. I like it because there aren't any instructions in it. How do you talk to God? God, oh, I need a need. Now, let me tell you how to work it out. You see, God, if you just do this and if you just do that, Lord, here's a need. Give it to him. You don't need to do that. That's all it takes. You don't have to say, God, here's my need. Now, now let's work on the solution. You don't have to say that. No, that did, no, they didn't do that. They just said, here's a need, Lord. That is the surrender of love. Here's my need. There it is, Lord. I'm just going to leave it up to you. That's it. That's really good. That's all it takes. But it is at this juncture that the narrative takes an instant turn. Jesus did not do what his disciple and loved one anticipated him to do. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that they were bewildered by his response. The action and the attitude of the Savior wasn't what they had anticipated, D. If we were honest, we would, we would admit that there are times in our lives when we are bewildered by God. We are perplexed by what he is doing or not doing in our lives and the lives of others. One of the most difficult things we have to handle as Christians is that what to do when God does not do what we have been taught to expect him to do. Let's just be honest, church. We act shocked when God does not do what we want him to do when we want him to do it. At first, we hear Lazarus was sick. Obviously, Lazarus was in some sort of distress. Mary and Martha would not have sent word of their brother's condition if it wasn't perceived as life-threatening. You see, the name Lazarus means whom God helps. This was the personal friend of Jesus. There are those who teach and believe that all sickness can be attributed to some sin in our lives. But if you are sick, then you have messed up somewhere deep. If your illness is serious, then you have set before Job and urged him to fess up. Then you have messed up big time. You see, the friends of Job ascribed to this school of theology. They said before Job and urged him to fess up to what he had done. But the truth of the matter was, however, Job's calamity and his illness had nothing to do with his sin. 
God had allowed the devil to touch him. So to prove his love and devotion to his God. Help me out, Holy Spirit. Trials are ordained by God for our good. To prove us and supply in our lives and our faith that which is lacking. Job 23 and 10, the Bible says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Peter says much the same thing in 1 Peter 1 and 7. He says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, much of the problem with Christianity is, is that we give too much power and oftentimes praise to the devil. Somebody ought to say amen. That is why most churches no longer have devotional service. The devotional service turns into giving the adversary power that he does not have. We always say, devil tried to stop me from coming. We say, did not feel well this morning. Nothing but the devil. The devil gave me a flat towel on my way to church. The devil very rarely say a word about God. But there are simply some things that happen in our life, no matter how uncomfortable, it is ordained and sanctioned by God. But notice the response of Jesus in verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness... It's not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus was clear when he said, this sickness. The Lord had a purpose in this illness, and it wasn't intended to the end of Lazarus' permanent departure. Lazarus would die, and God would allow it so to accomplish his purpose. Jesus said this was all happening for the glory of God. You see, one of the most amazing verses in the Bible is in verse 6, which says that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he spent two days longer in the same place where he was. Just imagine that, church. He deliberately waited for two more days before he came to them. But when he got there, we know the result of his coming. His delay is answering their call did not mean a denial of their call. You see, Jesus came late, but he was still on time. God always has our best interests at heart, believe it or not. But he acts according to his own agenda and timetable, not ours. God always has our best interest at heart. Jesus has a purpose in waiting to come to Bethany where Mary and Martha were. You see, the death of Lazarus was set to stage for the last and greatest of miracles performed by Jesus before his passion. Jesus would arrive in Bethany in his own time and raise his friend from the dead in a spectacular display of his power. At the raising of Lazarus from the dead, many would believe, trusting in Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Jesus said that the sickness and death of his friend would not only bring glory to God, but that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. We're talking about Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. From the dead. Just like some of us. We too place limits on what God can do. I imagine when Jesus showed up after three days, the sisters of Lazarus, as well as the crowd, understood there was nothing that Jesus could do at this point. Now there already have been six miracles in John's gospel alone. <laughs> Turning water into wine. Healing of the noble man's son. Restoring the impotent man, multiplying the loaves and the fishes, walking on the water, curing the man born blind. Six miracles. Now here comes number seven. 
And if God uses number seven, it's a perfect number. Then this is the climatic miracle. But there are some problems here. The people don't believe there's anything that Jesus can do. <laughs> After three days in the grave, thing began to break down in the body. After three days in the grave, all hope is lost. Someone even said, surely his body stinks by now. Jesus, we were just glad you were, you, you were finally able to show up. Why does God wait so long to answer our urgent problem? This is where I want to taxi to the term right here. You see, we have emergencies as human beings, and God just waits. I just don't understand sometimes why God doesn't just snap and come when we want him to come. We're back here in Bethany praying, and Jesus out there doing who knows what. He doesn't come. You pray over and over and over and nothing happens. Mary and Martha waited. Their brother got worse and worse. They waited some more. And I think they said, Lazarus, just hold on, man. Hold on. If you hold on, Jesus, he'll be here any minute. He's coming. I know he's coming. He would not come, but Lazarus finally lost consciousness. And finally, his battle was over, and he died. And I can just picture Mary and Martha saying, what, why did this happen? Jesus heals whole town, load of people. And he can't even come here and heal the one that he loved. He could have saved our brother. He was only 20 miles away. We know where he is. He's had the message, and he didn't come. This is a hard lesson to learn. No one likes to wait. We want what we want from God when we want it, church. However, it is our times of loneliness, our times of loss, our time of past and sorrow that we are driven to the very heart of God. God's timing, not our, is designed to increase our capacity for him. It's designed to sharpen our sensitivities and our understanding. It's designed to temper our spiritual life so that we may become channels of his grace and his mercy to us. Third Avenue, this message this morning is for those of you that are going through something. You need to understand, church, that it is not the devil. But God designed what you are going through. And he's using it for his glory. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, the sickness. Not that previous sickness. Not that previous surgery you've had. Not that other bad report that you received last week from the doctor. But this one is designed for his glory. You, know, you might not be going through a sickness today, but I can still hear Jesus saying, this one. I know you've been through some storms in your life. I know that you've had some trials along the way. But what you're going through right now, I'm talking about this one. Not yesterday's storm. Not yesterday's problem. This one. This one was designed for God's glory. That is why Paul said we go from glory to glory to glory. That problem that you're going through right now, that issue that you have been praying for over and over for a long time, this one was designed that God might get the glory. If you're trying to figure this out and trying to tell God how to do it and how to fix it, this is not about you looking bad or, or looking good or what other thing. This one was sent. For God's glory. I know you've been waiting a long time. But this one. I don't know how you feel about it today. But the storm may rise and the wind may blow. But I learned a long time ago, Third Avenue. If I stay on my knees, 
and keep my hand in the master's hand. He won't make a way out of no way. Oh, church, I found out that it's mighty hard to stumble when you're on your knees. God would work it out. Won't he work it out? Is anybody here ever had hell on your back? Is anybody ever here ever been down? I'm talking about showing up down. Did Jesus pick you up? Did he turn you around? Say yeah. Say yeah. Oh yeah, God will fix it for you. God will open doors for your church. Anybody ever know he'll be bread when you're hungry? Won't he be a mother for you? Won't he be a father for you? I don't know who you are today, but God will work it out for you. Has anybody ever been sick? I'm talking about showing up sick. I'm talking about sick when it seemed that you just can't get well. Somebody thought that they would be dead, but look at you now. You have to stand on your feet and don't be ashamed to let the world know that God is a doctor in a sick room. I'm a witness, church. He's a healer. Somebody here is living witness that prayer changes things. Prayer will send you some friends. Prayer, my soul is a witness. He's all right. Ain't he's all right? Say yeah. Hell might be on your back, but you hold on to God's unchanging hand. Get down on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. Yes, I know that my God is able. He's able. He's able to make a way out of no way. He's able to make your enemies leave you alone. I know he's able. I'm going home when I tell you this. When trouble come in your life, when your friends turn their back on you, when everything seems to be going to pieces, the secret is to find your own praying gown. Go down on your knees. Get a telephone in your bosom and call on the name of the Lord. I find out that when you pray and praise God, he will come and see about you. It doesn't matter where, where you praise him at, but you just praise him. You may be in your car. You may be on your job. And when folks see you moaning and waving your hand, you can tell them that the Lord will make a way somehow. I'm talking about Jesus. He came down through 42 generations doing nothing but good, healing the sick, raising the dead, making the lame to walk, the dumb to talk, feeding 5,000 with two fishes and five barley loaves, turning pimps into preachers, gamblers into deacons, prostitutes in the missionary, giving sight to the blind, tabernacle here for 33 and a half years, took up an old rugged cross, went out on a hill called Calvary. He just didn't walk up that hill to Gogata, a place called Skull. They whooped him up the hill. They nailed his hand to the cross, his feet on the cross. He said, if I, if I I'll be lifted up. I'll draw all men under me. They lifted my Savior up. They stretched him wide. They hung him high. He died. He died. Oh, yes, he did. They took him down. Put him in Joseph Barry's tomb. He stayed there all night Friday. All night Saturday. But the Bible said it was early. 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 Early Sunday morning, just before the break of day, the earth began to tremble around Jesus' grave side. And as a bright light gleamed from heaven, Jesus stepped up and stepped out of that old barry tomb with all power, all power, all power of heaven and earth in his hand. Holy Ghost power, saving power, forgiving power, healing power. I know since he saved my soul, I'm just fooling the nurse to praise him. I will praise him in the morning. I will praise him in the evening. I praise him when the sun going down. His name is Jesus. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the way. He's the truth. And he's the light. He's a friend when I'm friendless. 
I'm talking about Jesus, y'all. Do you know it? Whatever you're going through, I don't care how bad it seemed to you. Find your prayer closet. Get on your knees and pray. And ask God to deliver you from whatever. He hears you. As he was telling Martha now, who told you he was dead? Who told you he was dead? He took his time. And the song says he may not come when you want him. But he's always on time. You know why? Because he's an on time God. <laughs> Somebody here know. He's an on time God. Didn't he wake you up on time this morning? Didn't he get you here on time this morning? He's on time God. And my God, he never failed. He never failed. There may be one among us this morning who don't know Christ in the pardon of your sin. I don't care what you're going through. He don't care what you're going through. But he's a God of all things, not something. He's a God of healing, supplying your need, whatever. Whatever it is, take it to God. Give it to him. You can't do nothing about it. You've been wrestling with it for I don't know how long. I've been wrestling with it, I don't know how long. But give it to God. He's just waiting. Will you come?